Amanda, I've been talking to Mark Guerrero all day, and I know we would have an intimate uh, classroom discussion. And uh, I want to welcome the, our film crews. We have the Center for Latin American Studies that has sponsored Mark's visit here today, Mark Guerrero's visit. And they're also going to be doing some filming. And we also have the Canal, uh, do you mind saying that Canal again? Hispano. Canal TV. Hispano TV. So, you know, <laughs> there's a few of you. And so make very loud responses. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Boisterous responses to, you know, fill up our studio audience today. Um, yes, we've been, our, our sponsorship is also shared with uh, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. So we're very glad that they were able to bring Mark Guerrero out here. And I, how did I find Mark Guerrero? How did I, inter you know, um, learn about his work? Um, I, I, and I told him I would, I would mention this story. I went to actually a, a, a reggae show in Chicago, and it was the Agolites. And they're from Los Angeles, and they're Chicano. They have a sound that is blending funk in the 70s, and Kings in Jamaica reggae from the 60s. And I walked in, and I was struck by what I identified immediately as a Chicano sonority, right? They have an L, specifically an LA Chicano sound. And I noticed it immediately. And I said, what is this? How come I'm listening to Kingston, Jamaica from the 60s, you know, funk from the 70s, and yet my body knows instantly that this sounds like something that could be in the LA street scene, you know, in the 80s, at a Tower Power show with a bunch of, you know, Chicano cholos and lowriders in the audience. My body understood this sonority immediately. And I started researching that because it was important for me to understand how do I know that even though this is not a race band, this is not a Chicano identity band, how do I know that this is a Chicano sonority? How does my body understand that? And it's specifically an LA one. I started interviewing people. I interviewed the organist, and it turned out that his father was in a band called Tierra, which was an iconic Chicano rock band, uh, you know, from the 70s and 80s in LA. So I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense, generationally. Okay, I get that. There's this connection through, you know, generations. But that still didn't tell me what it is, what are these musicians doing that make me go, ah, that's a Chicano sound, right? Interviewing them, and then I interviewed another member, one of the founders of Tierra, Rudy Salas, and they were all telling me, you have to talk to Mark Guerrero. So I start looking at his website and understanding that he is archiving more than anybody else. He's interviewing more than anybody else. But as a musician, since the age of 13, he's been playing in bands at the age of 13. He was part of the first, his band, was it Mark and the Escorts, that was part of the first, um, you know, wave, on, wave. first wave of Chicano musicians and was in the first Chicano rock festival ever. And so he has been mapping that kind of sonority and also the politics of that kind of sonority since the time that it was emerging. So he was, you know, part of it and contributing to it. And he's talking about the guitar influences, the kinds of organs that are played, the, uh, please come in, don't be shy at all, okay? Just come right in. This event is for you. Please be welcome. And so I couldn't find anywhere else <coughs> somebody doing, you know, making, doing the work that Mark was doing. And, and I was excited to have the opportunity to bring him out here because not only was he a musician and has been participating in the scene and building it, he was also, you know, the only one pinpointing what these sounds are, what they mean, what this kind of sonority is doing in our lives and in, in terms of our community building. And he also happens to be um, related to Lalo Guerrero. His father is Lalo Guerrero, who's known as the father of Chicano rock, and some call him the first Chicano, I think, you the know, original. the original Chicano, right? So from the Zoot Suit era, um, you know, his father, Lalo Guerrero, contributed to what we think of as, uh, as Chicano sonority. And so Chicago it's a, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, yeah, so it's, it's very exciting that we have those uh, generations present here. And I know that Mark is going to have a lot to tell you about uh, the emergence of Chicano sound and, uh, and Chicano rock and roll. So please help me welcome our wonderful <laughs> You know, I was also lucky that I've always kind of been a pack rat because, you know, back then when I was 13, 14, 15 years old and, and playing gigs, I would always save the flyers, you know, I would always save the band cards. And so, you know, little did I know years later I was going to have a website and holy, I have all this stuff. 
and I've loaned them to, to movies, I've loaned them to, you know, they've been, you know, in uh, al album, CD booklets, they've been using a lot of things, you know, it's like an archive. But I always saved everything, and I'm so glad I did, you know. It's funny how all the things you don't plan in your life, you do something, and then all of a sudden they all come together. So, um, okay, let's, so anyway, my name is Mark Guerrero, I grew up in East Los Angeles, and I started playing in bands when I was 13 years old, and I've been playing my entire life, uh, singer, songwriter, musician, recording artist. As she said, my dad was the father of Chicano music, Lalo Guerrero. And uh, somewhere along the line, I started a website. And it's kind of happened by accident. And I started uh, writing articles on, on Chicano groups and interviewing people. And it's, it's 15 years later, it's a huge archive. And I get, because of that, I get invited to universities and I speak about it. And uh, so I've, I've kind of developed this, what I call lecture performance, where it's not just talking, but I might play a song show a video, it's multimedia, and uh, you know, think of it as a show and tell. You know, it's an informal show and tell, I'm going to share my experiences with you, my life with you. What makes it different too is like, like Paloma was saying is that I was a participant, part of it, and a witness to all this, and I know most of these people, including some of the older guys from the 40s. So, so I have stories that they told me that I've experienced myself, so it's sort of an insider thing, it's not like just a journalist telling you something or just a no, a professor telling you. You know, it's some <laughs> just not just a professor. Right? No, no. Yes. No. <laughs> Jenny Flexi. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it's just I'm just saying because you know I was a participant, so it's a little bit different. It's um, so that's what I'm going to share with you today. So I usually start out by singing a couple of songs to loosen myself up, to loosen you up. Not that you're not loose. <laughs> but just to kind of. Janelle, do you think we can shut the door in case there's other lectures going on? Forward. So it happened, my early musical life, like most people, I, I was just, uh, my band played the hits of the day. We started off playing surf music, and then the Beatles came out, and we did, we did R&B, we did James Brown, we did, we did Beatles, we did British Invasion. Uh, late 60s, we got into the Jimi Hendrix Cream, uh, Psychedelia, you know, we just went along with the times. But um, eventually I started writing my own songs, and my own songs were rock and roll songs. They were had nothing to do with Chicano. I think the first real Chicano song I wrote was my best one. It's called I'm Brown, 1972. And it's still the thing I think I'm most proud of, and you'll, you'll hear it later. But it was sort of a protest song, but at the same time, it was saying, I'm brown, I'm proud, don't mess with me. But it was saying, I'm brown, I'm proud, but I'm first a member of the human race. That's number one. So I'm really proud that I had that idea it wasn't all about get whitey, you know, it was like, at all. <laughs> no, it was just the idea that, hey, we're all human beings first, but I'm going to fight for my people and for our rights, you know. And, uh, but then, uh, somewhere along the line, after I had some major record deals, uh, I went back to school and I finished and got my degree in Chicano Studies from Cal State Los Angeles in the late 70s. And, and in studying all this stuff, Mexican history, Chicano history, uh, and learning more and more and more about the culture, uh, it started to infuse itself into my music. So my music became more Chicano. And I'll give you a couple of examples of songs I wrote in that late 70s period that, that started to move my uh, music into my own version of Chicano music. <clears throat> so um, this first song is one of my favorites that I've done. Um, the idea came from, I was taking a, a, a Mexican history course, and we were studying about pre-Columbian times, before Columbus came. And um, we were taught that um, when the Spaniards came into the Valley of Mexico, when, when Cortez, uh, they, they came over the mountaintop and they looked down upon the city of Tenochtitlan, the Aztec city, how they were blown away. The, uh, the chroniclers, the historians, were the friars. And this, this particular friar who was the, the scribe, he wrote this, and this was in the record. He said when they came over that mountain and they looked down into the Valley of Mexico and they saw Lake Texcoco with Tenochtitlan built on the lake, you probably all know the story of that, you know, because of their prophecy they decided they were going to build on this lake, so they had to create islands. And so you had these pyramids seemingly coming out of the water and uh, causeways, and it was like, they thought they were dreaming because they'd never seen anything like that in Europe. And so they, they literally thought it was the most beautiful city they'd ever seen. So that triggered this song. 
and I was lucky uh, in 1983, Herb Alpert, have you heard of Tijuana Brass, Herb Alpert? He, he owns A&M Records, he's the A of A&M Records. He recorded this, my song, uh, a trumpet version, instrumental of it. Sueño pre Colombino. So here's pre Colombian dream. I wrote it in 1977. So high above the valley below in the central plateau in old Mexico. I come upon these silver lakes as the morning breaks on the temples that rise out of the blue. And I look at you beneath heaven's where the ancient eagles flew. See the love that shows through your eyes as the lonesome coyote cries. I can see a people of the sun as the timeless rivers they run, and your precious stones they sparkle and they gleam in my pre Columbian dream. Line of my life. Straight as an arrow running through the lagoon, we sing for the moon. And not a moment too soon. I come upon a marketplace where a lonely face in the crowd could do nothing but cry. Though I knew not why. Dreaming of calamities by and by. shows through your eyes as the lonesome coyote cries I can see a people of the sun as the timeless rivers they run and your precious stones they sparkle and they gleam in my pre-Columbian dream night and night I started to say, well, I really want to reflect Chicano life uh, in, in music. So, you know, I came up with a lot of ideas, and one of them I wanted to uh, put my own spin on the whole cruising scene, you know, the lowriders and cruising down the boulevard. And that happened in many cities on the southwest. And, uh, in East LA, it was Whittier Boulevard, you know, and I, as a teenager, I cruised down Whittier. Eventually, the cops broke it up. And, uh, but for several years, it was a major thing. <clears throat> and so I, I wrote a song called On the Boulevard, and this is very Chicano because it's kind of bilingual. It is bilingual. <laughs> Here it goes. Mario was in the barrio, hablando with his friend Armando, waiting for Ana, pura Chicana, they were gonna go bailando. crowd on the boulevard. Well, you can play it hard on the boulevard. But if you play it hard, you better stay on guard on the boulevard. On the boulevard. Kiki is a friend of mine cruising down for one last time. 
songs and I have a song called Mijita, Mijito, but a female recorded it also. A song about my mom who was very, uh, uh, you know, one of these mothers is so optimistic, oh, it'll be all right, mijo, it'll be good, you know, just keep your nose clean and everything will be fine, I have faith in you. So I, I wrote a song uh, called Mijito, uh, and a, a wonderful female singer named Jerry Gonzalez, who's one of the best ever out of East LA, the best ever Chicana singer, feminized and made it Mijita from uh, her mother. And um, so, you know, I started writing some, my own Pachuco songs and went from there. So now, let me get to the, the video thing. So the next thing, I remember when I was in college, way back in the, in the uh, Jurassic Age <laughs> um, <laughs> era, uh, I took a speech class. I, well, I hated speech because I hated, I ha really had trouble getting up in front of a class, you know. I mean, I can perform in front of a thousand people, but this was mortifying to me. But we, you had, back then, you had, do you still have to take speech? It was a requirement. You couldn't graduate from college without speech, and I, that was the thing I feared the most. But anyway, the one thing I remember from that class is, if you're making a speech, you have to establish your credibility. Like, why in the hell should we listen to you? <laughs> right? They're sitting here, why is she listening? Who are you? you know? So this little, this is, I'm trying to establish, that, that song was part of it, no. And that's part two. Hopefully that helped. Okay. Okay, so, anyway, so here's, okay. Sort of a little gallery of my musical journey. That's me in the middle. Aww. Aww. Wasn't I cute? <laughs> Flat top. Uh, as a matter of fact, the name of the band was The Escorts, and that was my first guitar, my first amp. And there in the back, that's my dad there, we actually played at his nightclub, and he had a floor show on Sunday afternoons, so that's why kids were able to be there, and that was uh, maybe our third gig, but it was like, there it is. <laughs> so, so that was, was a multiracial and multi-ethnic group? Multiracial, well, yeah. And we, uh, well, yeah, we had a, an African American, and, and you know, once again, you know, life is—it's not you don't plan it, right? Mm -hmm. The way this band formed was the drummer Ernie. I met in the third grade. I played <laughs> clarinet in the band. He played drums, and he lived three houses up from me in East LA. And I was, you know, I was like 12 years old. I was playing in the yard, a 12-year-old kid. And he comes over and he says, "Hey," he says, "Why don't you get your guitar and app and come over?" A friend of mine's over. He's got a guitar. And I go, oh, "I don't know. I don't know. I felt like just staying and playing," you know. He said, oh, come on, I, okay, got my app guy. I went over there, and Robert Warren was there, and he had been playing a couple of years longer than me, you know, so I was like, so we just played, and that was the birth of the band, you know, there was no, I didn't go out looking for people, it was just the guy down the street, and he, this guy came over, and we started doing gigs, and that's how it started. Hmm. So that was Mark, that was the escorts. Now, you guys look really sharp. Oh, thank you very much. I had, that was a cool blue cardigan, collarless, that was hip. And then, uh, so then the next one is, it, it became Mark and the Escorts, and it wasn't my idea, it wasn't an ego thing. I didn't say, oh, now we're Mark and the Escorts. We, had a, we started to grow. We got a bass player, we got a sax player, and, uh, and the sax player had print shop at school. He printed up some cards, and he put Mark and the Escorts on it. 
And the reason was because at that time, there were a lot of bands that were Ronnie and the Casuals, Bobby and the Esquires, Art and the Nightlighters. It was very, you know, Little Ray and the Progression. So they made it Mark and the Escorts, and it stuck. So this is Mark and the Escorts. Cool, huh? And that's me with a guitar sitting on the amp. Same drummer. This is Ernie, the one that was on the drums on the last thing. And, uh, and there's the African-American gentleman. Rick Rosas, who I said, buy a bass and you're in the band. The last 20 years has been playing with Neil Young and, and Joe Walsh. You know? And I taught him everything he knows. <laughs> uh, Mark and the Escorts. And, and, we, and we started playing, that's when we became part of the East Side Sound. We were playing on the bill with all the top East LA groups, the Premiers, Countable the Headhunters, the Midnighters, and groups that went on to have national hits. So we played all these shows in East LA with them. Again, you see we have the, the collarless jackets, the tur turtlenecks. We were purposely kind of doing a Beatle pose because the Beatles had come out by then. And then this was our first record. Uh, I have a question. Uh -huh. Did you identify it at that time as a Chicano music? No, not at all. We were just American kids, you know, okay. playing what we heard on the radio. You know, we knew we were Chicano. We were on the <laughs> Chicano side of town. We didn't think about it. That's that's the whole point we've been talking about. That all the bands were like that at that time. It wasn't until like the late '60s that the Chicano consciousness started to come out, and the Chicano movement started, and Chicano studies started, and suddenly we started saying, "Hey," and then we, we got more. Latino into what we were doing. Okay. I'll get to that in a minute. So then I'll play you just a couple of seconds. This is Get Your Baby. And what's so funny about this is I was only like 14 or 15 when we did this. And I'm playing lead guitar on this. And this is what you would call a garage rock record. Today, right, garage rock. This record to this right now is out on about four or five, five or six compilations all over the world. You know, uh, there's a compilation in England called Mind Rocker. It's on there. Uh, with a bunch of, you know, the grassroots and all these, these white groups were one of the only Chicanos on there. And it's also in some Chicano compilations. But it's funny that that's the first thing I did when I was a kid, and that's probably around the world more than anything else I've ever done. It's crazy. <laughs> but I'll just play you a few seconds of it. It's just this really crazy, wild, instrumental thing. Uh-oh. Oh. Why isn't it playing? Can you do that? It's a line going for me. It seems really good. Is there some wrong? I need to lock it. Oh. Just so you can access it. Oh my god. But I thought I was on just by the fact we were on the website. Oops. Did it time out? Yeah, this happens when I tease. Oh, okay, it timed out. Yeah. Okay, should have been out. What was that? I don't know if this one's. No, that's not it. That's not it. Not it. Let's see. Uh, let's see. I can close. At the bottom of the screen, you should have be able to access to your. Okay, here's this. Now, if I click this again, right? right. Yeah. Does this? Okay. So. Yes. <laughs> LA sound, Parfisa organ, uh, Stratocaster guitar, and the way I'm playing too. There were actually um, actually four East LA groups recorded the same song. The premieres of Glenn Dallas, Cannibal Headhunters, and us. But ours has survived more than all of theirs. The other thing that was in at that time was having a lot of noise in the background. Some of the people would bring in like car clubs, a bunch of girls that would just scream in the background in the studio. We just did the screaming ourselves. To make to make it seem like a live recording. Sorry, that's Get Your Baby. That was the first record I ever did. Then uh, a few months later, we did our second record, which was Dance With Me. And that one's a lot more, uh, it had a vocal, a lot more... Uh, Organized, it's, it's 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 very. I don't I don't have a sound bite of it, but that was a very nice sounding record. But yet the other one gets more attention. Now here is an example of a major uh, show. I should have a pointer, huh? But anyway. I have one that I have one that you can use. Really? Yeah. That would be awesome. 
Did I say awesome? Yeah, that would be awesome, dude. <laughs> yeah, oh, wow, a little laser. Yeah. <laughs> How do you, do you press that? The first. Okay, yeah, okay. But anyway, uh, this was a major thing. This was 1965, and it was at the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles, and they got all the East LA bands together. And uh, uh, let's see. This was a major thing. Let's see. There's the premieres. They had a national hit with Farmer John. And that's my band. It's right there marking the escorts. Uh, let's see. The Blendells had a national hit. The Midnighters had a national hit. The Sisters were like the Chicano version of the Supremes. Really good. And Ursi Arvisu later sang with El Chicano. And she later she made an album with Ray Cooter. Uh, does that, the mid sisters or just the sisters? What? The sisters. The sisters. The sisters. The sisters. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. Anyway, she's, she made an album with, you know where Ry Cooter is? He's a legendary. Mm -hmm. um, he's the one that did the Buena Vista Social Club and a genius producer. Uh, so she's still around. Uh, the Salas brothers later became Tierra. They were singing with the Jaguars. The Romancers were very influential. Little Ray Jimenez was uh, the greatest singer performer out of East LA. That guy was like a James Brown. Like uh, Stevie Wonder, James Brown, and Smokey Robinson in one. I mean, he'd dance around, he'd sweat, he'd get on the ground, women screaming for him. He was a major talent, but he never had a hit record. And that's what inspires my website, because, you know, people like him, I believe if you were white or black, he'd be internationally known. But, it's, you know, the people in between, it's harder to break through. There was no ready market no. For, for not white and not brown and yeah, not black. Yeah, exactly. But Little Ray Jimenez was monstrous performer and singer. He's still around. Um, the Four Queens, an all-girl group. So anyway, this was a major thing. And this blew my mind too, because once again, this is something that I saved back then. This flyer, this poster. And in 2007, there was a major exhibit in Seattle at the Experience Music Project, which is a major museum. Paul Allen paid for. I don't know if you've seen it. It, it looks like a monstrosity. I think it's beautiful, but it's it looks like a monstrous sculpture. It's near the Space Needle. And they, they, it's like an alternate Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They've had like a major exhibit on Jimi Hendrix, Dylan. And so they commissioned one called American Sabor, Latinos in U.S. Popular Music. And probably because of my website, I was called to be the consultant for the Los Angeles portion. They had an L.A., Miami, San Antonio, San Francisco, and New York centers of Latino music. And each one had a big room. It was multimedia. It was a 5,000 square foot exhibit. So they took this flyer and they blew it up, you know, six feet. And so, so you know, to have lived this at that age, and, oh, the, and then, then the 40 years later, you go to this major museum and there's a gigantic blow up of this on the wall in the museum. It's like, wow. And it was amazing. And they, they had all kinds of stuff from the East Side Sound there, you know. So, and they let me interview. I interviewed like 12 or 13 people on video for their permanent archive. And for a, there was this place where you could push, push a button in here. The premieres talk about Farmer John or whatever. Great exhibit. Then it traveled all over the country, mm -hmm. and it wound up at the Smithsonian. It's a major thing. So anyway, good thing I saved my posters. So that was that. Good thing I was a pack rat. Okay, so let's see. Now here's an example of, of a typical dance in East LA in the '60s. Teen dance and show. The Midnighters with their new release, Whittier Boulevard. Little Willie G. The Four Queens, Ricky Shade, the Slauson Brothers, there's my band, Mark and the Escorts, the Impalas and the Sisters. All those in one, one dance, you know. Each band would play about, you know, 45 minutes and get off and the next band, come on. I look at the bottom, it says, sporty dress, donation $2. Yeah, sometimes it would say, girls dress nice. <laughs> they have to tell you, please dress nice. <laughs> No khakis and please dress nice. <laughs> wow. Now here was one. I love this one because it's got the premieres, the Blendells, and my band Mark and the Escorts. And premieres and Blendells at that time both had national hits with uh, Farmer John and La 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 La. And there's some more bands on here, Ronnie the Casuals, the Ambertones. I mean, there were so many bands, so many teenage dances to play. See, that's, that doesn't exist too much now, but there were just places all over the place for teenagers. And so these bands, we'd go, sometimes we'd have two gigs in one night and we play every weekend as teenagers. So now, 66 comes along, and that's me in the middle. And the band Mark and the Escorts, we decided suddenly that name was out of style, those kind of names. Uh, 
the British invasion had come in, so we became the men from sound. <laughs> and, uh, and we got very popular in East LA too. We played a lot of dances. We added another singer here, added a new keyboard player. And that was a, that band was the best band I think I had in the 60s. They were, they were really, really good. And there, now we get into the psychedelic era. And that's me on the far right. Longer hair, being ridiculous. With, this guy has a helmet on, and a tree on his head, and an axe in his hand. And that's the same drummer and same bass player, the guy that later played with Neil Young, um, in that band. We, the, the drummer, the bass player, and I stuck together through a whole decade. And then we made a, a record on uh, Cap Records, which is a uh, MCA company. So it was a, a major label. Okay, so that was kind of the 60s what I was doing, besides going to high school. And then the 70s came along, and that's me. I, I got a record deal with a, a major label called Ode Records, distributed by A&M, and I made a record produced by a legendary producer named Lou Adler. I don't know if you've heard of Lou Adler, but he just got into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame last year. Uh, he's one of the, I think he and Phil Spector are probably the two most famous producers of all time. You know, Lou Adler produced all the Mamas and the Papas hits, you know, Monday Monday, California Dreamin', uh, all the Carole King hits, you know, So Far Away, and, you know, all, all the Carole King things. And um, he was just a, a major producer. So, you know, I was only 21 years old and he signed me. That means something, you know, put out a record, put his name on it. So that's a, an accomplishment. So I went solo at that point. That's my record that I made, produced by Lou Adler. A song that I wrote, Lila Love Me Tonight. It was basically kind of a rock and roll song. And then that's uh, 72, I got a deal with Capitol Records. And uh, Beatle fan that I was, I was thrilled to be on the label the Beatles were on. You know, Capitol, it's pretty big. And it was then that I recorded I'm Brown. Uh, my first single was Rock and Roll Queen. It's a straight rocker. And then I came out with I'm Brown, and that's it there. And uh, in 19, um, uh, let's see, when was it? 2009, there was an exhibit at the Grammy Museum in Los Angeles called Songs of Conscience, Sounds of Freedom. And I was honored that that record and my original lyric manuscript was in an exhibit. Uh, it was an exhibit about how, how artists have used music and recording for social causes, for ethnic pride, for things other than I love you, baby, let's go dancing. You know? and, and so... Uh, Anyway, that was in the museum. <clears throat> and here's the, the one where I was telling you about the first Chicano rock concert. Uh, you see it says, presents the first ever Chicano rock concert, uh, September 17, 1972, starring El Chicano. They had just come off their first national hit, Viva Tirado. They were hot. They had their own uh, luxury RV. We showed up in our Chevys. Uh, uh, Elijah was a great horn band from Montebello in East L.A. And then Mark Guerrero with the Mud Brothers. Mm -hmm. I told you, Paloma, we, when we got the record deal, I wanted to be the Mud Brothers. I thought that was a funky rock and roll name, but they said, no, no, it's got to sound more Latino. And so we became Tango, and that was a mistake, because everybody thought we were from Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> so it, so it, didn't, it hid who we were. So anyway, that also was in the, in the same museum. Uh, the Grammy Museum, that poster. And it's going to be in a book coming out tomorrow, a book's coming out called Turn Up the Radio, Rock and Roll in Los Angeles from 1958 to 1972. And uh, they borrowed a lot of my flyers and stuff, and, and they wrote about me a bit in the book, and there's some of my pictures in there. And uh, they're putting this flyer in there. And they asked me to write a couple of paragraphs why this was important and why it was historic. So, who's, who's the author of that book? The author is Harvey Kubernick. K-U-B-E-R-N-I-K, I think, Harvey, Kubernick, Turn Up the Radio. I'm sure the rest of the subtitle will come up, but I can't wait to get that. It's coming out tomorrow. Uh, and, he, and he touches on, you know, you know, the black music of uh, South Central, the Chicano rock on the east side, what was happening on the Sunset Strip. You know, it's the whole music of L.A., not just the, you know, the white side of town. Okay, so let's see. And then here's the group Tango. That's me there. I kind of have the same haircut. <laughs> uh, and that's Richard and Ernie, the same bass player and drummer. John Valenzuela on guitar. And we were like, you know, I'm proud of this too because we were like 10 years ahead of Los Lobos. 
Los Lobos' debut album on a major label was like in 1983. This is 1973. So I think, you know, we were the first Chicano hippie band, long hair, plain rock and roll, country rock, you know. And, and from what I heard, that they, they, they were aware of the album. And in fact, I heard that a couple of Los Lobos were in the audience at that Feria de la Raza watching us, you know, and that they had the album. So maybe we gave them a little inspiration here somewhere. Uh, and that's the Tango album. And like I was telling you, Paloma, I think this was a huge mistake because if you saw that in a record bin or a CD bin, you'd think that was Argentinian tango music. Why would you even think it was a rock and roll record? Mm -hmm. So I think that really hurt us. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Why did you change it from that Because they told us to. You know, they, I, if I had been stronger, I was young. I was 23, 24 years old. You know, when they said, you should change your name, I said, no, we really want to be the Mud Brothers. It, it was rock and roll. We felt like brothers. Mud is brown. You know, we, you know, we really felt that was a great name. And they said, no, no, you should, because, you're, because you are Latino. It's not that they cared. They just thought that, they you know, if you're not a white group, you have to have an explanation. You know, what, what are these guys? <laughs> that happened to me when I was at Capitol Records. I heard that the, one of the executives said, well, why are these, why is this Chicano doing country rock? Why not? I'm an American. But they couldn't, they thought we belonged to the Latin division. So they just thought that, whether you, you know, since Santana was popular and Malo and all of that, well, since you're Latinos, you should, but the music had nothing to do with Latino at that time. It was rock and country rock, much like Buffalo Springfield or the Eagles. Or, this was about the first year that the Eagles, we were like simultaneously starting with the Eagles, doing the same kind of thing. Uh, so so they, they said, it's got to have like a Latin thing. And like I was explaining to Paloma, there was a movie out at the time with Marlon Brando called Last Tango in Paris. Mm -hmm. It's a very sexy European mm -hmm. art film. And, and I thought, Tango, that's kind of a cool name. And, and the movie was out, and that is Latino. And so it was like, uh, it was a compromise. And that's, that's the problem when, you, when you're an artist and you compromise, you usually get screwed, <laughs> you know. And so I did it, and, and like I said, it was a huge mistake. I mean, I, I believe that if we had been on the cover, these four long-haired hippie Chicanos, the Mud Brothers, it would have gotten a lot more attention. People would have seen it. I'd like to hear this. But, you know, where are we, you know? So I think it was, again, I was young. I wasn't uh, strong enough to fight a big corporation. And I was like, okay. It was, and, then on, and then they had our picture on the back. And then the, the, the famous photographer said, I got an idea. Why don't we take a picture with your moms and dads? I go, that's not rock and roll. <laughs> with your moms and dads? <laughs> and and, uh, and so, so again, I compromised. I said, well, how about... On, they, they said, well, how about your cars? I said, well, how about, how about just at our houses? Okay, fine. So they just came to each person's house, and we found a place in the yard. But, you know, these are, they're all compromises. You know, but I was young, I was... Uh, you know, there, there are some people that even at that time would have said, screw you, and I don't know, but I, at the time I was uh, not experienced enough, you know. And the idea of not having a, a market for, to not knowing how to market. Yeah, they didn't know, they didn't know how. Not knowing what they the, didn't know this how. thing was. But was if you hear this record today, I mean, it still sounds good. I'm very proud of it. It's, it's, it's really got nine browns on it. But it got sort of lost in the shuffle. The stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Huh? The stereotypes, anyhow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So then, here, here we are at the, at the Roxy Theater in Hollywood on Sunset Strip. It was the first year it was open. We were one of the first groups to play there. And that's us. And even there, they made a mistake because they had us opening for Flash Cadillac and the Continental Kids, who were like a Sha Na Na 50s revival band oh, with the grease back hair. So the, these sort of biker, rock and rolly people came, and then when this, this country rock, rock Chicano band was there, Big mistake, but we survived. But it was not the right crowd for us. We should have opened for, uh, you know, Jackson Brown or, you know, the Eagles or somebody. So, then, then at this point, then I got my BA degree. See, after all that stuff, <laughs> so, you know, I'm gonna go back to school. I'm going crazy with this shit. <laughs> so I went, I went back in the classroom where it was safe, and, uh, <laughs> no, and uh, and I got my degree in Chicago studies. And then again, like I said, you know, like a lot of things in life, it wasn't a plan. I just wanted to go back to school. It was the only subject that interested me, the only thing I would even think of studying. And then when I, in the class, the first class I took, they were telling me about how few Chicanos uh, had degrees. It was, at that time, it was like, you know, BA degrees, it was like 5% of Chicanos, or, you know, and, you know, masters, 2%, 1%, you know. And I thought, you know, there's no, there was nobody in my immediate family, nobody in my extended family that even had a BA degree. 
I thought, you know what, I want to get a freaking degree just to do it, you know, number one. But then I really dug learning about my own culture. For the first time, studying about things that, oh, my grandfather came from Mexico to work for Southern Pacific Railroad, just like they said in the book. And, uh, you know, and you really put your family and your, your life and your history into context, you know, because we never learned that in school. We just learned about European, Euro Eurocentric view of history. So I got into it, and uh, I must say I got 15 A's and one B. I was into it, you know, and, and I was just playing. So I went back to playing clubs, clubs at night, studying during the day. And like I said, little did I know that in the future that was going to come together because I didn't do that for a job. What was it going to be a professional Chicano? <laughs> you know, what was I going to do with it? You know? So it's just a, you know, but, but, but it served me later because, again, with the website, and it gave me a little bit of academic cred, a little bit, and uh, it all kind of came together. <clears throat> okay, so that was that. I got the BA. Now we get into the 80s. See, I keep, everyone, I start getting, you can see me age here as we go. And then you see the, the, real, the real old guy right now. Who is that? It's me in the 80s. And uh, see, shorter hair. I had a, I, on the Boulevard came out. It's a nice cover by Ignacio Gomez. The artist that did that was the one that did the famous Zoot Suit with Eddie Olmos, you know, the oh, poster. Yeah, the style looks good. Yeah. He took 11 months doing that to put the album back, like a year. But it was great. <laughs> um, let me see if I can play. I'll play a little bit of On the Boulevard, this recording. The one I played a minute ago. This is the, one of the versions of it. Can I get the volume up on this? I skipped I'm Brown, I'll have to come back to it. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll play the live version. But um, anyway, then, then this is where Herb Alpert recorded my song, Pre-Columbian Dream, that I was telling you about that I just did. Let's see, this is Sueño Pre-Columbino, Pre-Columbian Dream. It's supposed to be Colombian with a U, right? Otherwise it would be Colombian. Yeah, yeah, see, in Spanish, <laughs> yeah. It, 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 yeah. No, in Spanish it's correct, because Colombino yeah. is Columbus, uh -huh. Colombiano is somebody from Colombia, mm -hmm. but it, in English it's Colombian with a U, mm -hmm. otherwise it has to this country. So they, what did they know? But they screwed that up. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I was happy to have Herb Albert record my song. And there's my dad's Arditas. You guys, anybody aware of that? Among all the other things my dad did, you know, he wrote in every style of music, of Latino music, but he also came up with sort of the Mexican version of Alvin and Theodore and the Chipmunks, but these are squirrels, Las Arditas. <laughs> Pamphilo, Demetrio, and Anacleto. Pamphilo, Demetrio. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and Pamphilo was like the, the, the travieso, and he was always screwing up, and my dad was like, Pamphilo, sin vergüenza, you know. And uh, Los Dientes de Pamphilo sold a lot of records down in Mexico. And, but anyway, what was really cool was he started making the Ardita records in the 60s and put a lot of singles and then he got signed to EMI in Mexico and Mexico started putting out albums uh, in the late 70s of the Arditas. So you, you meet somebody from Mexico that was born, you know, that grew up in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Every, when I'm in LA, every busboy, every waiter, every gardener, anybody I meet on the street from Mexico Arditas, oh yeah, they, they, they grew up with it. They grew up with it, they love it, you know. But anyway, but I, I got to, you know, occasionally I got to... Uh, I mean, we have two LPs. Oh, you do? Yeah. Oh, good. Well, well, in the 80s... In the 80s, I got to be an Ardilla. 
Uh, Ardilla. No, in the 80s, I, I used to write some of the songs. Like I wrote that Pamphilo Rey del Rock. I would write the music. My dad would write the Spanish lyric. We'd bring in one of my bands and we'd cut the tracks. Then my dad and I would fly to Mexico City. This is wonderful memories back. We did it three or four times in the early 80s. We'd fly together to Mexico City, take the master tapes. We'd do the vocals in Mexico City. We'd spend a week there recording and going out to the Zona Rosa and hanging out, staying at the Hotel de Lange. And so I have great memories of that. And then one time I was even railroaded into wearing an Ardia suit. And I was like, with the, the tail, and my brother and I were dancing. Yeah, so I, I won't tell anybody about that. But I was. Your secret uh, safe. Uh, yeah, 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 it's going to be on. He spotted TV. Let me see how he spotted Okay, then came the 90s, and I'm getting older. And then I decided to make another group for my original music, and it was called Radio Aslan. See, I'm getting more political there, Aslan. You all know what Aslan is? Anybody know what Aslan is? Um, I'm sure you do. Okay, well, um, Aslan is supposedly, it is, where the Aztecs originated. The, the Aztecs, in their um, history, they were a wandering tribe. You know, For 300 years they wandered, they were a nomadic tribe, until they wound up finding the Valley of Mexico. And there was some kind of a prophecy that somebody, chief, had had a dream that wherever we see an eagle with a serpent in its mouth, that's where we're supposed to settle. So they saw the eagle on the lake. All the engineers had to come up with a way to, to make the pyramids on the lake. Uh, so that's how they wound up there. But many Chicanos believe that Aslan was the U.S. Southwest, that the Aztecs originated in the U.S. Southwest around Arizona, New Mexico, and, and they wound up down there. People, Mexican historians, don't like that. Oh, no, 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 they were from down here. And it's ridiculous because this was Mexico mm -hmm. until 1848. But they, they're very territorial about it. They say, oh, no, it can't be. They can't be from up there in Gringoland. Uh, <laughs> Gringoland, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, uh, but, but, you know, there are, there are things that, that are, make it believable. Uh, for example, uh, um, I think that the Nahuatl language of the Aztecs is related to the Apache language. They're, they're related languages. And, uh, and then there are certain things like the clay pipe and there are certain artifacts that Apaches used, that the Aztecs used, that no other people in Mexico used. You know, so there's, yes. there's reason to believe that... The Udo Aztecan family language. Udo, Udo family, Aztecan language, language yeah. The language family yeah. is, is, you know, obviously crosses the, the Utes and, and the Apache, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's very possible. So uh, the Chicanos of the late 60s, early 70s, Chicano, the, the, you know, we all... Uh, took that as, as a badge of thing. We started to call the American Southwest Aslan. This is our homeland. The poet Alvarista wrote the Manifesto de Aslan. Right, that's right. This was the call for the Chicanos to organize and yeah. create Chicano right. Studies Department. Right, exactly, exactly. And so that became a, a thing that, that we referred to the Southwest as Aslan, our homeland, you know. And, uh, and then the real radicals wanted to take it back. You know, we want it back, like that's going to happen. But, <laughs> but uh, so anyway, I took that. Uh, and I, I made my band Radio Aslan, meaning a voice from Aslan. Mm -hmm. And my music was a voice from Aslan. And uh, so that, that's where that came from. <coughs> I'd say I'm wearing a mariachi jacket. <laughs> Custom made. Like the Aztecs. Yes, yeah, right. Yeah, they, yeah, you know, actually, yeah. And, uh, so then then uh, here's when I started the, uh, the website in 1998. And that's uh, because of that. I've been asked to speak places, and that's you know, been wonderful for me. Um, and then here's my dad. My, we finally, after all these, my dad and I recorded together since I was a teenager. We wrote songs together. We did so much, but we had never like really uh, performed in concert a lot together. We'd done two things where I did a, a set, he did a set, we did a couple songs together. Maybe twice in the 80s we did that. But here, finally, I made a band of guys my age to back him up. We called it Lalo Guerrero with Mark Guerrero and the Second Generation Band. And we played for about two years, and we played in Tucson, Arizona. We played the Getty Center in Los Angeles. We played the Gene Autry Museum. We played some casinos. But the, big, the biggest gig, uh, four of three of us went to Paris, France in 1998. It was my dad, myself, a guitaron player, and, um, yeah. Second from the uh, guy, second from the left, and 
and we used Flacco Jimenez's drummer. Flacco was there, and we played in Paris, France. And I'll show you a video later of that. And uh, so anyway, it was wonderful that we finally got to work together. We we would do his music, and we do a couple of mine thrown in. We do on the Boulevard a song of mine called O oh Maria, which is a polka in English. And uh, we kicked butt in, in in Paris. It was it was uh, the most emotional concert I ever did. I, you know, when I came off the stage, tears just started streaming out. Without, with, I didn't know why. I wasn't boo-hooing, but I mean, it was unbelievable to go to Paris, France, and and to you know get like a ten-minute ovation. You know, it, it was like Chicanos in Paris. You know? <laughs> wow! And then you know, Flacco was there, and we all went out partying later at a Mexican restaurant, and it was like one of the great experiences of my life. You know, but anyway, so that was that. So, but my dad was already 82, 83. By the time we did that, we could have been doing that since the 70s. We never thought of it, you know. but I'm glad we got to do it. And here's the thing. This is one of the gigs. Where is this? Uh, Spotlight 29 Casino. Lello and Mark Guerrero were the second generation band. And Mariachi Yeah. Yes, that's right. And now we're getting to keep getting older and older. Here's the 2000s. Then I made a new version of Radio Aslan. I had like a nine-piece band. Uh, that's me right there. Can you, can you see the pointer? Yeah, you can see it. Yeah. Um, so then, then I, I, th at that point, I started doing gigs with Malo, Tierra, El Chicano. Um, here's some posters. See this? Tierra, Malo, Mark Aron, Radio Aslan. And then, uh, for a short period, I joined the group uh, Redbone. Do you know that song? Come and get your love. Have you heard that song? Hey, what's the matter with you, man? man? Oh, yeah. um, the leaders of Redbone were actually Chicanos from Fresno, uh, Pat and Lolly Vasquez. Due to pressure from record companies, they, they changed their last name. This is a topic that you're going to see coming up. That you know, if you were Latino in the 50s, 60s, 70s, they made you change your name, like Richie Valens was Valenzuela, because you you, you know, if you were Gonzalez, or whatever, you'd have less of a chance, you know. So anyway, they were told to change their name. They changed it to Pat Lolly Vegas, like Las Vegas. Uh, the two other members, the drummer was a full-blooded Cheyenne. The other guitar player was part Navajo, part Chicano. They were Chicano, but they, but all, all Mexicans have Indian in us, you know, and most of us have more Indian than Spanish. So you know, it was legitimate. And, and uh, Redbone, they would be in concert, and they were full Native American garb with headdresses, and they were rocking out, you know. They were major in the early 70s. They had like three major hits. They toured the world. So I really enjoyed um, playing. I love that music. They, they have some great music. And I was playing lead guitar with them. And then here I am again in 2011 playing with, that's Pat Vegas, the surviving. The, his brother passed away uh, like in uh, a couple years before that. And uh, he's the only surviving. No, the drummer's still alive, but he lives in, in Holland. So I played with him again in 2010, 20 on guitar. And then I went to Liverpool, England. It's another major thing for me. I'm, I'm a huge Beatles fan. You know, I grew up loving the Beatles, and to this day, I love them. And, and uh, they were such an inspiration to me musically in so many ways. And uh, so uh, I made two trips to Liverpool, and I played here at the Cavern, where that's where they started, mm -hmm. the Cavern yeah. Club. And, and because of the connections I had there that I met, people that grew up with the Beatles and played with the Beatles in the 60s, uh, I got to be on the radio on BBC Merseyside talking about Chicano music in Liverpool, talking about my dad, talking about the East Side Sound, and then playing Beatles songs. You know, it was a fantastic. Uh, and uh, so here, then they put me, they put me on first, which is incredible. And it's interesting, because whenever I go there, it's like, oh, Mark Rowe, the American. Here, I'm not an American. Here, I'm a Chicano. <laughs> there, I'm an American. Yeah. Yeah. And here's the Grammy Museum thing I told you about with my song, That's My Tango Group. This was the, this was the display at the Grammy Museum. And there's the, the flyer, the first rock and roll concert. And there's my I'm Brown record. And down below is my original manuscript of I'm Brown. Here's an album of the East Side Review that came out from that Shrine Auditorium co uh, concert I showed you earlier. And then I played with the new version of the Cannibal and Headhunters band in 2010, and I toured around and had a lot of fun because I got to back up some great uh, 
classic rock artists, people that I liked as a kid. Like I got to, we got to back up Denny Lane, who was with Paul McCartney and Wings for ten years. He was in the Moody Blues. He's the one that sang that song, "Go now, go now, go now." You guys might be too young to know it. You guys know who Campbell and the Headhunters were? Campbell and the Headhunters their original. Their song? Their hit, their song was na 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 And they opened for the Beatles second year. They opened for the Beatles, yeah. They they did. But but none of the original guys were left in this group. All of them are dead, except for one. And and this drummer, the second from the the right, uh, sort of an uh inherited the name. He had been playing with Can with Cannibal for years, and when Cannibal retired, he let them move ahead. And they got another guy to be Cannibal, and then he died. And he got hit by a car, and, and they've, they've gone on. So at the time I was uh, asked to join, uh, I needed the work, and I went for it, and I had a good time. We went to uh, Ash uh, Ashland, Kentucky, and we went to uh, uh, Carlsbad, New Mexico, and we were in Sacramento, El Paso. Pittsburgh, we did a PBS special in Pittsburgh with a lot of classic rock bands. But anyway, we got to play with Denny Lane, we got to play with uh, one of the original guys from Badfinger, who was the first group that the Beatles signed. Uh, you know, if you want it, here it is, come and get it. And uh, no matter what you do, I will always be with you. And uh, one of the guys from the Hollies and, and different, different groups. So it was a good, another great experience. And. Uh, and then this is this is very recent. This was my most recent concert in December at Cal State Los Angeles, and uh, we're, we're doing all my stuff. And I always throw in a couple of my dads, and I'll show you a clip from that too. So that's my current band that I would put together if I get a concert. Mm -hmm. So you just saw sort of a, a quick thumbnail of from a little escorts to, to this, <laughs> but as you see, I've, I've played my entire life, you know, and uh, and in the middle, I play a thousand nightclubs and restaurants and bars and truck stops and whatever, you know. Like some sax player told me what happened, they're all joints. <laughs> some, some old black guy that played with Lionel Hampton and Ray Charles, you know, saying, man, you know, one day you can be playing at the White House, the next day at the outhouse, you know, yeah. and he goes, he goes, they're all joints. <laughs> anyway, so that's that. So that's, that's a little uh, of my experience. So now, so this is a, a twofold thing. So this is, uh, Oh, are the cameras ready? Or? I don't want to. Okay. Are we rolling? All right. <laughs> it's getting very showbiz. Yes. Um, so, uh, so this is a quick scan of my dad's career, and but it's also part of the '40s we're talking about, you know, because he was he started out in 1939, and uh, what he he had some lucky breaks here too because, well, first of all, let me say this: this was his first group. That's him in the back. He was very skinny. He was like six one and a rail. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was his first group, Los Carlistas. Mm -hmm. They were named after King Carlos of Spain. Mm -hmm. King Carlos had taken over for Franco, the dictator. And everybody's like, oh, there's now a king, and everybody's happy in the new Camelot. And so they call themselves Los Carlistos, Carlistas. And uh, they had their own radio show in Tucson, Arizona, where my dad was born and raised. And, uh, and they were, um, they represented the state of Arizona at the New, York's World, New York World's Fair in 1939, was it? Or whenever it was, 39, maybe. And so he, he always tells the story that they were, the, as he described himself, hayseeds from, from Tucson going to New York City. Can you imagine 1939, the Empire State Building? And, you know, they didn't know how to, you know, hold a fork, you know. And they were there, and they, they, um, they played at the World's Fair. They, they were on the... Major Bowes Amateur Hour National Radio Show, and uh, so that was a Carlistas, his first band. And then there's a second group, Trio Imperial, Trio Imperial, in Los Angeles. Uh, my dad was signed to a label. Well, before I say that, my dad just told me the story that blew me away. Just how life can be, you know, the the serendipity of life. My dad worked with this producer, Manuel Acuña, who was a, a, a famous composer in his own right. He was born in Mexico, uh, Manuel Acuña. And, uh, and um, he was like my dad's cohort and co-producer all the way from 1939 into the 70s. And I said, well, how did you meet Acuña? Well, they met on the street. Mm -hmm. Think about that. My dad was in L.A., downtown L.A., 
He's walking down the street. Acuna's coming the other way. Acuna stops him and says, hey, are you from Sonora? Just by the way he was dressed. Because, no you know, Tucson, Sonora, right next door. There's a sort of similarities. And uh, he says, no, I'm from Tucson. Oh, and they started talking. And Acuna says, are you a musician? He goes, yeah. Do you write songs? Yeah. Well, why don't you come down to my office tomorrow? Let me hear what you do. Okay. Went in, played some songs, got signed up to Vocalion Records, which was a major label at the time. I think there were some blues artists on it. And Manuel was like an A&R man for Vocalion. My dad wound up uh, making a few records for Vocalion. And then Acuna took him to Imperial Records. Imperial Records was run by this uh, person named Lou Chud, who was... Can I say he's a crook on tape? <laughs> but, but, but what he did, my dad would get paid $50 per side with no royalties. So he'd get 50 bucks. So he'd, he'd do four songs. He'd get 200 bucks. He was thrilled because can you imagine in 1945 or whatever, 200 bucks was like 2,000 bucks maybe. And, and, but he, little did he, my dad realize that he was getting ripped off because some of his records would sell 100,000, 50,000. As a matter of fact, in that book, um, uh, the Mexican-American Mojo, uh -huh. Don Tosti, who's another 40s musician of, of importance, says in the book that Lalo made Luchetta a millionaire. You know, wow. so my dad was getting 50 bucks a side and, and my dad made that label a success and made him a rich man. Lou Chud and Imperial Records eventually signed Ricky Nelson, Fats Domino, and it became, it went from a Mexican label to a rock and roll label, and the guy got even richer. But my dad was the first successful artist. He did about a hundred recordings with the True Imperial, and about 200 as a solo artist for Imperial. And uh, so, um, so here's the True Imperial again. And during that time, that's when my dad, you know, he always did everything. He could, he could do a, a ranchera, he could do a bolero, he could do salsa, he could do comedy. You know, he was a really world-class singer. He, he could do it all. And um, um, I forgot where I was going with that. Um, oh, so he got the idea. To, to put Chicano slang into his recordings, some recordings of Caló, you know what Caló is? Caló is Chicano slang, and it, it originated in El Paso, Texas, and, um, and it wound up spreading throughout the Southwest, and that's what's like, ese vato, chale, you know, orale, all those kind of words are, are, are pachuco, caló. And so my dad, with the trio, in trio style, made a, wow. at least a dozen recordings using that, where he's, they're singing and suddenly they go, oh, and starts, he starts riffing on, on, on Caló. <laughs> so that was a very clever thing, and the, and the Pachucos and the Chicanos started buying this stuff up big time. It was selling a lot of records, and he made a song called La Pachuquia, El Pachuco, El Pachuco y El Tarzan. The Tarzan was a Pachuco from Mexico City, it was a Tarzan, because Tarzan used to have long hair. <laughs> and... Uh, so he made all these records, you know. And then, in the later 40s, when he went solo, that's when he started doing the really hip with a band, boogie-woogie, swing, blues, in Caló and Chicano. And that's, that's one of the things that made my dad so legendary. One of, he's known for the Arditas, he's known for the Pachuco songs, the, the play in movie Zoot Suit, used his recordings from the 40s, Vamos a Bailar, Marijuana Boogie, uh, Chicas Patas Boogie, Chuco Suaves. So he's known for that. He's also known for two songs that are classics in Mexican music. Nunca Jamás, a ballad that has been recorded by Trio Los Panchos, Jose Feliciano, Javier Solis, and, and then another song he wrote when he was 17, Cancion Mexicana, which is a ranchera, tribute to Mexican music, and it was recorded by Lucha Reyes, who was the diva of Mexico in the, in the 40s. Lola Beltran, who was the diva of Mexico in the 60s. Uh, mariachis, any mariachi in Mexico or in the United States, ask them for Cancion Mexicana, they're going to know it, they're going to know Nunca Hamas also. So my dad is really rare in that he's a Chicano that crossed back, you know, in other words, he he's, has songs that are famous in Mexico as part of the Mexican repertory, is that what you say? And so, I mean, that's why his career is so amazing, and, and because 
he did that, and then he had the Pachuca legacy, and he's got the, uh, you know, he did political songs, and he did comedy, and he did children's records, he did parodies, and yet he never became economically rich. Number one, he got ripped off a lot. He was not a businessman. And number two, it's always been a niche market. You know, Chicano stuff is not going to be, you know, global like that. It was always just small labels. You're lucky to sell 30,000, 50,000 records, you know. So uh, he never got rich. We, we lived well, but with all that talent and all that success, he was, and also he looked too Indian. He looked too Mexican. You know, there, as you'll see when we do this, there have been a lot of people like Vicky Carr and Andy Russell, light-skinned, can pass, you know. People change, you know, like my dad said, it was like, they didn't want some guy that looked like uh, Geronimo singing love songs to white women, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> it, might, it might scare the, scare the hell out of him. You know? So yeah, they just, so he didn't have much of a chance to sing in English, even though he could, he could, he, he had no accent. He could speak English or Spanish with no accent. And uh, so, yeah, so that. Can I tell my class, we listened to Andy Russell last week, yeah. mm -hmm. and he had the, 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 all the violins, you know, compared to the swing era, you know, really, you know, so like, yeah, that, that, you know, the galo and the bachuco. Mm -hmm. And then you have the crooner, Andy Russell, who can pass for white, and he had a right, national exactly. TV show. Right, exactly. Andy Russell. And La Guerrero wasn't able to. No, he could never have done that. That kind of crossover move with yeah. his career. Yeah. So. Heard of. Now here he is in his prime. This is my favorite photo of him. In fact, I think we have this, we do, we have this picture on his, his gravestone in Tucson. He was cremated, but there's a wonderful, like a pedestal made of marble. It's got that picture on it, and it's got a wonderful quote that he made, uh, sort of like he wrote his own epitaph that was fantastic. Um, but anyway, that's my favorite photo of him. That's probably a, around 1950. Here he is with uh, Cinco Lobos. That was his, his real hip band. Uh, coincidentally, the sax player arranger, David Lopez, his uncle, he's related to Cesar Rosas of Los Lobos. So I've always wondered if, you know, Lalo Guerrero y sus cinco lobos, I wonder if that's where they got the name Los Lobos. It was possible. I never asked them. Or maybe they wouldn't admit it. But anyway, here's an example of a song he did, my dad did in the mid-50s, when he was doing rock and roll in Spanish. And, and my contention is this is as good as Elvis or Jerry Lee or anybody. And, you know, people always talk about Richie Valens, and he was great, but this was before Richie Valens. Because they always talk about Richie being the first Chicano rocker. My dad was really the first Chicano rocker, but it was in Spanish. But check this out. This is, this rocks. <laughs> And then this is his band in the 60s uh, from his nightclub. Great band. And here, here's an example of him in the 60s, how good his voice was. Here's a song he wrote. And look at her beautiful voice. <laughs> Okay, then here's his Arditas. And here's a song that I wrote, and I had my dad write some of the Spanish lyrics, because my Spanish isn't great, but I wrote some of the Spanish lyrics. And this is one of the Ardilla things we recorded in the early 80s in Mexico. 
And on this one, my dad is singing in his real voice, and then the Ardiitas come in. So this is my band, and I wrote the song, and my dad wrote most of the lyrics, and Rock and Rolando in Mexico. One of my ardillas. So, so here's like now here's like a quick run through some of his albums. Here's an album he did in the late '50s, Torero. This was very popular in. Oh, uh, artist, so cute. Yeah, this was popular. It sold a lot in Argentina. Uh, here's Los Exitos. This had a lot of cute songs. Here was a song. It was like a Spanish version of Mac the Knife. Um, Marcario el Carniciero, or what would you call it? Yeah, and there's a Un Marciano en la Tierra, where you it's like a little Martian, La Televisión, El Weedy Weedy, these two uh, gossipy. Yeah. So yeah. after he composed all the other kind of music, he dedicated to kids' music? And he just did everything, always. He didn't like change from this to that. He just like, he just would write different things different days. You know, he just didn't want to be. There, pigeonholed. Is know. there any movie about this music? Well, there's a documentary, uh, okay. Lalo Guerrero, the original Chicano that my brother produced. It's a wonderful documentary. It's about a 50-minute documentary. It showed a lot on PBS. You can buy it. Well, actually, the only place you can buy it is through my website. <laughs> oh, now here's uh, this is marijuana. Marijuana This is uh, early '60s. Oh, by the way, if you, you can see here, my dad, when he was a kid in Tucson, there was a, there were some major um, diseases going through. There were pe people were getting um, um, smallpox and big epidemics going on. And my dad was was caught with the smallpox thing, and he really suffered. And, and his face was covered with scabs, and he used to scratch it. And and uh, some people died from it. He survived, but he had horrible scarring on his face. You know. So you could see here, he had a lot of little pockmarks, you know. And so when I was a kid, my dad was pretty heavily pockmarked. As he got older, it kind of smoothed out, and you didn't notice anymore. But, uh, but it, it, really, it, it really affected his life because because of it, when he was a, a teenager, he felt very homely. And he was, you know, when he, as he got older, he was afraid to ask girls out on a date because he felt, you know, scarred up. And, and, and so it, it helped create a certain... Uh, uh, um, uh, slight lack of self-esteem that he had. You know, he was he was kind of shy, and he was kind of, you know, once he became a star, it really helped him a lot. But um, it really he had to overcome that. It was a hard thing for him. And I, I, I wrote a song about him that I mentioned that in there. Uh, I may play later. Anyway, here's the mini father that Arnaldo. <laughs> um, now this song, my band is playing. Oh, this is a, this is the story. It's important to tell. Um, I, um, my dad wrote this song about 1965, and he brought my band in, Mark and the Escorts, we were playing on this. But what was his genius, my dad did so many innovative things. What he had was two bands in the studio. I may have told that story, you may have heard it on the radio, I don't know. But what he had a Northanio band, a guy with an accordion, and drums and a bass. He had a Northanio band, Los Hermanos Ariano, and he had Mark and the Escorts here. And the song would go back and forth from ranchera to rock and roll. And what's cool is that you know, nowadays there's so many studio tricks and digital technology and you could fly tracks from here to there and copy. You know, none of that existed. This was on tape and there was no trickery. It was literally that band would play and stop and then we would play and then we'd stop and they would play and my dad was singing live. So what you're hearing here was recorded at one time with two bands in the same room all in one take. There was no trickery, no editing. And this is really cool. And this sold a lot in the Southwest, and then a Mexican group recorded it, and, uh, and they, it sold really well in Mexico. So it's a little ranchera. Thank 
se les mira hasta la espalda Una polla que se llama Reina También se pone ya a su mini falda Y cuando pasa tu compadre del alma Me juro que hasta la lengua se me escala Le canto así That's me on guitar That's my band smooth it goes back into the ranchera. So that's a mini father that I know. And I was, I was only 15 when I played. I had a 12 string electric guitar on there. And then, um, then here's a La Celosa y El Celoso. That was on Capitol Records. He's a good actor. Yeah, yeah, who he was. And then here's a parodies of Lalo Guerrero. He was very famous for writing parodies. He had like uh, the Mexican Santa Claus, Pancho Claus. He had the Mexican Elvis, Elvis Perez. Elvis Perez, El Mariachi, from the land of the Huarachi. And, uh, and then he had um, Pancho Lopez, which was a parody of Davy Crockett. And he had, um, instead of, for to oh solo mio, he had, there's no tortillas, there's only bread, there's no tortillas, and I'm so sad, my grief I cannot hide, there's no tortillas for my refrides. <laughs> and, uh, and then he had tacos for two, two cocktails, cocktails for two, and so he had a bunch of parodies. Uh, he had, I left my car in San Francisco. Yeah, so I left my car. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so I'm just saying, how many artists can you think of that had that kind of variety of things he could do well? Okay, and then he did an album. Did he get any pushback because he's Juan Diego there? What's that? That wasn't yeah. sacrilegious. Which one? <laughs> the other cover. Which one was that? The parodies. Uh, which, which parody? Oh, the, the cover? cover? Because of what? Because he's Juan Diego. No, not necessarily. No? He's just trying to be silly. Yeah. I don't know who Juan Diego is. Who is Juan Diego? To who the Virgin de Guadalupe. Oh, no. He's not trying to be that. No, no he's, just, he's just trying to look silly. Um, I, I know who Juan Diego is. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the Los Lobos. Now he is because the, the reader gets to interpret yeah, right. right. her, yes. her reading into the, the piece of uh, art, right? So. That's right. Los Lobos did a children's album in the 90s uh, called Papa's Dream, and they asked my dad to be the, 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 I guess their dad or the abuelo or something. And I was involved in those sessions. I did sing on one song on, on La Bamba with them. And um, my dad sang several of the lead vocals on here. It's really nice if you ever get a chance to hear it. It's fun. Um, they're, they're going cross country in, an, in, a, in a, a balloon, and they're going to each region and different, playing different songs. And it's, it's really cool. And then this is the original Chicano. This is the documentary, and it's got a, a, a 22 song CD with it. So that's, oh, and then uh, here's when we played uh, the documentary Chicano Rock. This was early on when they weren't quite finished with it. They did an event and showed what they had of the documentary. And my dad performed, and I performed in the Midnighters at the Gene Autry Museum. This was in like in 2004. So my band played, and we backed up my dad on some things. And here's my dad getting the National Medal of Arts from President Clinton. Oh. And uh, my brother and I were lucky to go with him to the White House because my dad's wife, my dad's se second wife, uh, didn't like to fly. So, oh, well, we'll go. <laughs> so, so we went instead and uh, had a tremendous experience. And, um, but anyway, this what happened here was why they're laughing. The ceremony was, was not at the White House. We went to the White House afterwards. The ceremony was at the, um, the Mellon Auditorium of the uh, Department of Commerce. Gigantic, gigantic room, and there must, must have been a thousand people there, a huge room. The other recipients with my dad, Lionel Hampton, mm -hmm. um, Robert Redford, uh, Edward Albee, the playwright who wrote Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, uh, Maurice Sendek, who did those children's mm -hmm. books, uh, Bill Moyers, the journalist, um, incredible company. You know. Which year? This was about 1997, I think. Okay. And um, 
So anyway, so we go there and we, we went to the, this was very impressive. So before the, the, the ceremony, all the, the people and their families were put in a semicircle backstage and President and Mrs. Clinton came in. We didn't know for sure, but they came in. They greeted each one of us. We shook their hands, got a picture, and uh, we met them. And what was really impressive about Hillary, she is a smart lady. She, she met like 50 people. Oh, let me shoot my hand, shoot my brother's hand, Salalo. And then they go in, they do the ceremony. The president would make a speech about each recipient, and, and then the president and the first lady would walk over to the recipient, put the medal on them, shake their hand, take a picture, and move on. And so um, they introduce my dad, they walk over to him, and they uh, put the medal on, they pose, and they started to walk away, and my dad pulled Hillary back, you know? <laughs> and and he, like he wanted to take another picture. And okay, so they both came back, president came back, they posed again, and, and, and they laugh, that's why they're laughing. And then the president of the United States goes up to the podium and he goes, that guy's still got a lot of salsa in him. <laughs> <laughs> and we have that on video, you know. And, uh, but anyway, the thing that impressed me about Hillary is then when that happened, my brother and I were sitting down there in the first row and she turned around and looked at us and said, because we had cameras, she goes, did you get it? I go, yeah. Like she remembered we were his sons. And in that moment, she looked at us and said, did you get it? I go, wow, what a mind to meet somebody for two seconds. Great racial profiling. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, we were the only Mexicans. But the fact that she had that kind of awareness kind of blew my mind, you know. So you can see, we have the video of this, and you can see her look down and go, did you get it? Yeah. So anyway, that was, so we got to go to the White House afterwards, and, um, and, and they sat us at different tables. I was at a table with uh, Stephen Sondheim. He's another recipient that wrote the, the music to West Side Story and Send in the Clowns. The president of the um, uh, Library of Congress, Tawny Little, the former Miss America, Tawny Little Schneider, or whatever her name is. And uh, so I'm the, and my brother's, at, my dad's at the table with Robert Redford, and you know, it was incredible, big dinner, a lot of people. Uh, and then we, there was a dance afterwards, you know, and, and the Marine Band was playing rock and roll, and Hillary took off her shoes and she's dancing, you know. And, <laughs> And uh, my dad was steadily drinking champagne, and so was I. And my dad was 82 or whatever, and he was getting a little buzzed. And, <laughs> and he goes, I want to dance with Hillary. I, go, oh. I said, Dad, I, don't think, I really don't think you should. You know, you're, you're 82, you're tipsy, it could be really dangerous. Oh, I want to dance with Hillary. I go, and I talked him out of it. <laughs> but, but he did go up to the president. It was amazing. The president of the United States was standing in the middle of the dance floor in between songs. And my dad goes up behind him and taps on him. And the Secret Service is around. Like, and, uh, and, and the president turned around, smiled, and put his arm around him. And they talked. It was cool. <laughs> so anyway, it was an amazing uh, experience being in the White House like that all night. You know? And there I am. There I am in the background. See? <laughs> Champagne in hand. Isn't that funny? My dad was the president and I'm in the back right there, lurking in the background in a tuxedo. And uh, that's the last time I ever played with my dad. Uh, he passed away six months later. He was 88. He performed right up. He did one more performance in Tucson after that. So he, he performed up to like four months before he passed. And down here is the legendary Ry Cooter. And uh, so... I think we, we did Los Chucos Suaves right there. Mm -hmm. And that's the very last performance he did in Tucson. Mm -hmm. What a great pose that is, huh? Mm -hmm. He was reacting to the ovation. And then when he passed, a political cartoonist did this. He has St. Peter as a zoot suitor. <laughs> and, he, oh, and, and he's welcoming him in. And then there was another one that he did. Club Pachuco, final, Pachuco. Club Pachuco, final show tonight, Lalo Guerrero, Father of Chicano Music, political satire Ike, and all these new suitors are coming out. So, so that's my little thing on my dad. Now let's see, let me see some, if there's, let me switch it up a little bit here, and I want to show you a couple little clips here. Uh, let me show you a little vignette on my dad's life and career, it's like a three minute vignette. <laughs> Lalo Guerrero was born in the Barrio Viejo of Tucson, Arizona on Christmas Eve, 1916. His parents, Eduardo and Concepcion, 
passed on a love for their native Mexico and the love of music. His mother taught him to play the guitar, and that was that. By his teens, Lalo was singing for tips at Tucson's El Charro Cafe with Los Caquistas. The quartet became so popular, they represented Arizona at the 1939 World's Fair in New York and went on to win a national radio talent show contest from the great stage of the Radio City Music Hall. Lalo took his guitar to Los Angeles in the late 1930s to sing on historic Olvera Street. The white and by the mid-40s, he, like he began his recording <laughs> career with the Trio Imperial before moving on as a solo artist in 1949. Bilingual and bicultural, the music pioneer was the first to bring American swing to Spanish language music in the 40s with a string of hit records including songs later used in the 1979 play and feature film, Suit Suit. Lalo dominated the Latin American charts in the U.S., Mexico, and South America throughout the 50s and 60s as a vocalist and songwriter, with as many as three hits in the top ten at the same time. The music legend's versatility is unmatched by any artist in any language. Boleros, rancheras, mambos, cha-cha, salsa, tejano, corridos, children's recordings, and comic parodies in English and Spanish. He did them all. Internationally recognized as the father of Chicano music, Lalo Guerrero did more than entertain. As Linda he gave said. a voice to the Mexican-American Chicano experience and chronicled that history in song. The Smithsonian Institution declared him a national folk treasure, and his countless other honors include induction into the Tejano Hall of Fame, a National Heritage Fellowship Award, and in 1997, the National Medal of Arts from President and Mrs. Clinton for a lifetime of creative achievement the first Chicano ever to receive our nation's highest arts award. Did you get it? See, see, did you get it? See that? It's amazing. So let's see what else is in here. Uh, so. Now here's uh, an example of me playing with my dad when we put that band together. This is us in Tucson, Arizona, 1999. Uh, my dad's doing his song, Muy Sabroso Blues, a, a song he wrote and recorded in the late 40s. And uh, this is the band I put together for him. And I'm on lead guitar. You might not recognize me because I was about 30 pounds lighter, 15 years younger, and I had a ponytail. So, But that's me. When I, whenever I tell you it's me, just believe me. <laughs> just take my word for it. But this is Muy Sabroso Blues. Can I get a little more volume here? I need a little more volume. I don't know how to get it. Okay. Thank you. 